Welcome back viewers and listeners to the TMC Talk Show. Today we are sitting down with Perry McCarthy, the original Stig. In this episode, we talk about Perry's climb to Formula One, his book Flat Out Flat Broke, and of course, what it was like to work as the Stig on Top Gear. Stay tuned for an episode full of laughs and interesting anecdotes, giving you an insight into one of the most popular figures in the automotive world. Welcome back to the TMC Talk Show. Today, we're sitting down with none other than the Stig. Um, now, I know what you're thinking, and don't worry, the Stig won't cross his arms and hide behind a helmet. Instead, we will be speaking with the Stig's human counterpart named Perry McCarthy. Uh, first off, thank you for coming on to the show, Perry. I know that many listeners will want to hear about your time as the Stig. But before any of that, I would like to talk about your racing career. So you didn't start off in karting, but you did slowly progress through Formula Ford, Formula 3, and Formula 3000. Um, as you outlined in your book, none of this progression was easy, but then finally you were given a chance by the Andrea Moda Formula 1 team. Um, other than, of course, just generally being happy, what did, what did it mean to you to finally reach the elite and elusive category of Formula 1? I, I mean, it, it meant everything to me because when I kicked off racing, my absolute target was was nothing else except getting to Formula One at all costs, you know. Um, but you know, the thing is that there was myself and Damon, actually, we were kind of getting older and older and we still hadn't got to Formula One. So Damon got a, a, a fairly bad deal when he went into F1 and, and so did I. But you take whatever you can get and just think, OK, maybe I can do something with it. But um, sadly, the team were really not good. <laughs> right. And I mean, that's an understatement. So so we, it was impossible for us to do anything with it. And, and then Damon, of course, his own career the following year, because he was um, test driver at the same time to Williams. And then he got the unexpected call up once Nigel Mansell left the team after becoming world champion at the end of 92. And then Damon got into the Williams car and then, you know, the rest is history for Damon. But sadly, my own F1 career was a nothing more of a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, well, as you just said, your Andrea Moda, your one season with the Andrea Moda team was filled with stress, frustration, disappointment, not to mention you had the whole super license debacle as well. So why exactly were you at odds with the team owner, Andrea Sassetti? And how did you try to handle that situation throughout the season? Oh, I didn't handle it well, but there was nothing. Ha there was nothing to handle. I mean, you know, as I was at odds with him because they were bloody useless. Yeah, they weren't putting me out there. There was no testing, um, and then, you know, there were the first Grand Prix I did. There was um, what happened is I the car didn't even go onto the track. The second Grand Prix I did, we I left the pit garage to go in for qualifying, and it went thirty meters and then cut out. So the next Grand Prix, that was a real, that was a real struggle for me. That was the Italian one. That was, um, uh, or San Marino, sorry. That was a, a full seven laps that I had. So that was, I had to really be fit for that one. Um, and then, the, and it just went on and on. Yeah, Monaco was like three laps. Canada, we didn't even go out onto the track because the engines didn't turn up. France, the team didn't even turn up. <laughs> uh, England, one lap. Germany, one lap. It was just... You know, I, I've had prouder moments than my F1 career. <laughs> you know. Well, why why was Andrea Sassetti essentially like allowed to sabotage his own driver? Did the FIA never try to intercede and force him to give you a drivable car? I mean, to be quite honest, it was you know you you're not compelled to have to put effort behind the any of your drivers, and uh, so he didn't. You know, <laughs> but that was. You know, they kept trying to get away with stuff. They had virtually no money. There was a lot of people that were inexperienced. There were a couple of good people. But, you know, if that car had actually been run correctly, I don't know, we might have qualified for three or four Grand Prix or something. But uh, because there were a few stragglers at the back end back in those days anyway, there were other people struggling, but none. Not, I mean, we brought a new meaning to the word struggle and bad. You know, we weren't mediocre. We were professionally bad. <laughs> well, looking back at your time with the Andrea Moda Formula One team, is there any positive memory that you can bring away from that experience? Yes, I, I stayed alive. Yeah, <laughs> that was the and and uninjured from that season uh, because both of which could have been on the cards. I mean, they made a dreadful mistake uh, when I was trying to qualify at the Belgian Grand Prix. They fitted a steering rack that was flexing, 
which basically meant as I went into Eau Rouge, one of the most daunting corners in motor racing, which is flat out probably into it, 170, 180, the steering jammed, and there's a wall facing you. Now, that wasn't good. Um, now, luckily enough, I've sensed it tighten as I turned in. So I, I absolutely hit the brakes immediately. Some of the downfalls, even our car had downfalls, some of the downfalls off the front, came up and just allowed me to turn the wheel enough this all happened inside one second you know so so if i hadn't been able to do that i think they'd still be digging me out the wall it would have gone that deep in um, it's now time to switch gears a little bit and move over to the off the grid segment uh for those of you who don't know this is essentially the segment where i get to ask some unconventional questions and hopefully provide a new insight into perry's personality and career um well, I briefly brought up your book, Flat Out, Flat Broke, but one thing I could sense from reading it was that your life as a driver was wild and rough around the edges. Um, going out into the pub, getting into fights, getting into crashes. Did you like living in the excitement of that environment? And do you feel that this may be something missing from motorsport today? Oh, I, <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I, I it, it's, it's just, I mean, you know, we will, we were all professional. I mean, yeah, I was I was training and everything else. Um, it's just I think everybody's got even more professional since, so there don't seem to be any punch ups anymore. Or, you know, nights down the pub. Yeah, no, even I didn't go down the pub the night before a race. You know, so I was like maybe a, a, a bottle of beer or something, but you know, nothing mega like that. But during the week, then yeah, I mean, life was for living. So I was kind of fairly flat out and having a great time, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah. Um, during your racing days, you're often found with the group dubbed the Rat Pack by the media, um, and including the likes of Johnny Herbert, Damon Hill, you, who you discussed a little bit before, and then former Team C talk show guest Mark Blundell. Um, you those obviously losers. Heard... Sorry? Who you don't those know? Those losers, yeah. Those losers. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, you were all very close with each other and mutually supportive, but how did you balance being friends and being competitors? It's a really good question, actually. Uh, it just came naturally. Um, you know, one of the things that you could rely upon with that little lot is that they were hard, um, but they weren't stupid, you know? And it was the same with me. I was, yeah, I would never deliberately take somebody off the track. I mean, it's happened as a mistake, you know, but I would never deliberately do it. Sorry, I should edit that. Unless somebody tries to take me off the track, <laughs> I would never do it first. If somebody tries to take me off the track, then yeah, they would get it right back. And I would not quit until we both went in the wall or they did, you know? So, but I don't, that's not the way I wanted to drive. And we were all, all felt the same way. Martin Donnelly could be pretty hard to be quite honest, but they were all, you know, fabulously talented racing drivers. And, uh, you know, we, we just, we box fair, but it was hard. And then after the race, we'd have a giggle, have a laugh maybe go to the pub and and see each other away from racing as well. So yeah, it's you're right. It's a nice question and and we're we're proud to have all been such great mates and friends continue to this day. Was there ever an affirmation as to who the best dig was, i.e. the fastest? Because according it's to easy, Dad, you don't you don't need to say anything more. It was me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about the others, Sid. It was it was me. Okay. The others, rubbish. Okay, okay, because the the only reason I ask is because I've also, I've read your book, and I've also read Ben Collins' book, so for who, for those who don't know, Ben Collins is who, uh, the person who played the stake after Perry, and I, I remember really well when um, when Ben Collins was going to do testing um, with Andy Willman, I think it was, there, you know, he, he recounted how Andy Willman was like, oh, wow, he's faster than Perry's times. So oh, that's no, 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 not, not just faster than the, the fastest I'd ever been. He did it on his very first lap. Yeah, it's something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Wow, he's amazing. It was, you know, I don't think he did, but they put it in the book. <laughs> it's so, hilarious. So do you, do you not think very highly of the other Stigs then? Well, not him anyway. <laughs> did do, do you yeah. know who the current stig is i think the current stig's been there around for 10 years right still anonymous i don't know i think they might be using different ones different you ones know, it's uh i you know there was I, I did watch a show recently where there was a that the stig was on and whoever it was i thought oh he's pretty good yeah 
I, I saw I saw him do some stuff and I thought that was good. Um, there was a really funny moment actually when I was watching the show many years ago and suddenly the Stig was out driving this Ferrari and I looked and I went and my wife was watching it as well. And even Karen turned around and said, you know, I was quite proud of it actually. She turned around and said, um, who, uh, who's driving that? I said, I don't know. That is good, you know? And suddenly, of course, they did the reveal afterwards. It was Michael. Yeah, Michael Schumacher <laughs> pretending to be the stick for the day. But I tell you, it showed. You know, I could see it on TV how good that guy was. And they don't come a lot more brilliant than Michael, you know? Yeah, that's. I do remember very well that one episode with Michael Schumacher. Um, it was pretty unexpected. So throughout your career, you've spent a good amount of time doing after-dinner speaking. Um, on Top Gear... Clarkson and crew had a challenge with cheap off-roaders where the punishment was after-dinner speaking. Have you ever tried to help them overcome their fear of after-dinner speaking? What, Jeremy, James, and Richard? Yeah, they. I, th I believe it was... Uh, I, I'm just trying to go from memory here, but I think it was the very last episode that they did as a trio before they moved to Grand Tour. Oh, uh, I'd say I didn't see that show, but if they were pretending that they couldn't do after dinner speaking. Really, they're pretending because all of them can, you know? They're all, you know, they're all, they've all got a great turn of phrase and they're they're all quite witty and they and they certainly know how to write and perform. So, I, you know, that that was just for the camera, Sid. Just I wouldn't camera. worry about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they, were, they were messing around. Well, I think, I, I don't doubt that they could do it, but I think they were, they were talking more about how much they disliked doing it. Oh, right. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, that's that's a different thing. I mean, you know, I've I've given cranky about fifteen hundred speeches worldwide. Um, it's it's normally worked, but the funny thing is, you do remember, you know, there's literally just been a handful of occasions, less than that, where it's it's the evening didn't work out. You know, either the audience just weren't alive or just didn't like me or whatever but you know when a joke doesn't land and you're standing there going uh start the car <laughs> <laughs> well of course you kind of you kind of had to do a lot of speaking and jokes and stuff like that first to kind of gain favor with sponsors back in your racing days and then you also did it to actually pay for your trips to the grand prix right yeah because the when i came into formula one uh the team was so broke they couldn't afford to pay me and they and they not even give me the travel expenses now at the same token we were completely broke here you know we were in the process of losing the house because i'd been racing in formula 3000 and i'd done i'd done a few property deals where i built up some money but we signed the house off against the formula 3000 drive so that went goodbye to that that was just three races in formula 3000 and it was quite a nice house it just shows you how expensive F3000 was, you know? And then in America, I wasn't getting paid, even though I was kind of, I was on pole a lot and leading, you know, an awful lot of the stuff. So you've got several years of not being paid, having to pay huge interest. And then by the time we got to F1, we, we were completely broke and I still had to find more money to get to the track. So you're right. Um, there were tour operators that said, look, Perry, we'll fly you out there. We'll put you up in a hotel. But of an evening, you come and speak to all our guests and, you know, tell them what's been going on and telling the stories and everything else. So I went, yeah, okay, fine. And that seemed to go well. And then that different agencies heard about me and just started saying, you know, can you come here? Can you come there? And yeah, it's it as a, as a kind of separate career, it, it's ended up being pretty good. Yeah. So it's definitely something that came naturally. And, uh, Hey, right now, all of that experience is paying off, right? For all the teams. That's, that's your polite, about. that's, that's your polite way of saying I've got a big mouth, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, hey, when it comes to interviewing someone, I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all the time that we have for the Off the Grid segment today. For now, it's time to go back to the main interview. So, you know, in the Off the Grid segment, I, I touched upon it a little bit about you being the Stig, but now it's time for the proper questions about being the Stig on Top Gear. So, okay. how did you get the gig as the now ultra famous Stig? Well, you've mentioned my book, and when we first published it, we had a big launch party in London, uh, actually just opposite the Ritz. It was an Audi dealership, and I was driving for Audi at the time, or racing for Audi at the time, pardon me. So we had a lot of friends there from Formula One and some friends from television, uh, two of which were Jeremy Clarkson and the producer, his friend Andy Wilman. 
And it was there and then at the book launch, everybody was having a good time. And they said, um, we've got an idea for you. And I went, okay. And they said, like, we're looking for this you know, secret racing driver and we're going to be bringing Top Gear back on air because at that moment in time, this is uh, like halfway through 2002, um, Top Gear had been off air for quite a while. So then I said, we're coming back to Top Gear and we've got this idea and we want you to be dressed in black because I was the original Stig, as you know. Um, you know, so they said, you're going to have, Jeremy said, you'll have black boots, black overalls, black gloves, a black crash helmet, a black visor, and we're going to call you the gimp. <laughs> I said, no, you're not. And they were pretty serious. And I went, no, 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 no. I'm not being called the gimp because if you have ever seen Pulp Fiction, the film, you'll know that the gimp isn't saying you really want to be called, you know? So I refused that. And then they was, they really want, I said, look, then do it without me. But then suddenly they came back and said, okay, we've changed it. How about the Stig? And I went, that's fine. Uh, did a part of you ever want to be a member of the presenter trio or were you happy? Yes. Yeah, you didn't want to? Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to carry on being the Stig. I, I wanted to be one of the main presenters because, you know, there's, I, I would have more creativity and, you know, really and truly, I'm not being flashed, but I, I've driven the fastest cars on the planet, racing them. So driving a new Ferrari or Lamborghini, yeah, great. And I'll always give it a go and push as hard as I can. But it wasn't through of the week for me, you know, yeah. so I, I wanted to kind of extend my career. My interests were in presenting. But um, but they kind of wanted to keep me as the stick. So we went into the second season and then it just wasn't working out for me. And I just said, I, I don't want to do this. And they said, OK, you know, they didn't they didn't, you know, start crying and begging me to stay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you just touched upon it a little bit, but, you know, the stick is described as this almost robotic character who objectively tests whatever car he's placed in. Um, but from a more realistic standpoint, there are probably going to be certain cars that suited your drive st driving style more than others. So how consistently were you able to drive each car at its absolute limit? Yeah, no, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's what I do. It's what other racing drivers do. You know, the, you'll be the, the, the biggest variable after a few laps will probably start being the tires and the brakes, uh, as in no tires and no brakes. <laughs> I, I love so far how nonchalant you've been as like about the role of the Stig because I feel like there are a lot of people like, wow, the Stig. And you're like, you know, just another day in the office for me. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, we were we did have a big smile on our face about how big it all became because, you know, nobody knew how big Top Gear was going to be. And certainly nobody had any idea that this new creature called the Stig uh, was going to be incredibly popular in so many different countries. But, I mean, I, I had a bit of fun with it because they just wanted it to be, you know, a secret racing driver. But I kind of wanted to cross my arms and make him grumpy and not understand anything. And that's what I started saying to them. I said, look, you know, as a race driver, you've got to talk to a lot of people, maybe sometimes when you don't want to and you're about to drive a car or something like that. The stick doesn't have to have any of those connections at all. It does, doesn't even stand, understand human behavior. All he understands is wanting to be in a car, holding a steering wheel with his foot flat out. Everything else to him is not just a nuisance, but it's in, in, just incomprehensible, you know, that that's it. So that's what, what I thought I'd try to bring to the party there. And I think that that's what we succeeded in doing. Yeah, and you've, you've talked about it a lot that you feel like even after you left Top Gear, your presence was still there because you feel like you kind of created the character of the stick that they continue to use, right? Yeah, I mean, it was, I, you know, I, I, it wasn't exactly, you know, um, Steven Spielberg, you know, uh, as far as uh, creation was concerned. It was just a few basic things to just say, okay, we're going to make this guy, you know, moody and detached and everything else. So, uh, it clearly worked. So it was the right idea to just stay with that kind of idea. Who among the Top Gear crew knew that you were the Stig? Because I've heard that quite a few people in the motorsport world already knew that it was you. Yeah, they did. Yeah, but um, but I wasn't I wasn't really confirming it to many people. But I think that the, the way I drove, that's one thing. The other thing that was the giveaway was probably me crossing my arms because I probably used to do that at a track a lot i've got what we call bandy legs my legs bow out so uh, that's probably another good giveaway 
And um, yeah, and I'm the only racing driver ugly enough where they had to put a crash on me and then still black the visor out so you couldn't see him, <laughs> you know. But I think that, I mean, it's funny, there was a TV presenter who does a lot of shows in the States, actually, who called me up the following day and just said, morning, Stiggy, after the first ever show. I went, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I won't tell you what he actually said, but he said, basically, he said, I know it's you. <laughs> that, that's it. So, <laughs> so that was, uh, I started laughing, you know. So time now for one more quick diversion. Um, it's for the fan question segment. So this first one is from at ZK. Um, we, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but what kind of stipulations did you have to abide by while under secrecy as the Stig? Well, I think that was it, really. The, 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 the main stipulation was to keep my mouth shut and not tell anybody, <laughs> you know? It's like one stipulation about being a secret racing driver. <laughs> Keep it secret. Keep it secret. <laughs> That's the big thing. I mean, it was quite funny is that they said to me at the beginning, you can't tell anybody. And I said, yeah, okay, fine. You know, uh, I said, I'm going to have to tell the wife. And they said, no, you you can't tell the wife. I said, shut up. I said, right, you know, I'm going to have to tell the wife. So they said, no, no. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, why? I said, mate, you try getting up at six o'clock in the morning, just from head to foot in black leather <laughs> and saying, I should be home around about midnight, darling. And I said, "Yeah, I see your point." <laughs> so, so you would you would arrive to the track already in your full stig getup, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only thing I clearly wouldn't wear on the road is the crash helmet. But it was a it was an old airfield, so I used to park just before the security gates and then put the crash helmet on. You know. So, but I mean, Andy Wilman and Clarkson were really the only members of the crew who knew that it was you, though, right? Other than that, you still had to keep secrecy from other crew members. Yeah, I mean, that, Jeremy knew, obviously, so did Andy, um, but so did James, and so did um, Richard, you know, but clearly, we we just, you know, to, to make it work, you play it as if you don't know who it is, you know? Yeah. But there were actually very few people inside the production unit who, who knew who it was, you know? Uh, in fact, somebody in there, I think they got fired uh, and then they went to the newspapers after the first series and they probably earned some money from telling the paper that it was definitely me and the papers were papers were all over it and we tried to play it down but they knew it was me so um but we played it down and just carried on going for the next season anyway the second question is from at shy town exotics did you have any say in coming up with the plot that killed off your character no i didn't no no, it was, um, but I thought they did a great job on it. They went to extreme lengths on that, didn't they? You know, that was, uh, you know, I'm, qu I'm quite proud of the way I was actually killed. Well, actually, I, I mean, I did make it back, but I was, you know, underwater for seven years before I managed to get back to UK shores. <laughs> I was uh, adopted by a friend, uh, by a, a school of friendly dolphins who looked after me while I was at the bottom of the ocean after being fired off the aircraft carrier. So you had no idea. You just watched like the first episode of the next series and you just saw it then? Yeah. 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 I knew it was going to be good because Andy told me, he said that he didn't want to spoil the surprise. And I, would, I went, okay, I'm not going to ask anymore. I'm looking forward to it. You know? Okay. So it wasn't like acrimonious at all, though. They wanted to do something kind of fun to kind of send you off. Oh, yeah. No, sure. I mean, I, I didn't want to continue. Uh, and as I said, I don't, yeah, I, I think they knew that I didn't want to continue, so they weren't that worried about losing me, you know? It's as far as they're concerned, they could get another driver and go out and do the same job, really. Because if if the driver doesn't have to say anything, then, you know, you can put any Muppet in a, in a suit and uh, send them off in the car, you know? And they found one. Found a Muppet. <laughs> um, well, actually, I, I, sh I shouldn't say. I'm going to call it the second stig, not the Muppet, because one day I think I would like to have the second stig on my show as well. Uh, <laughs> You've gone I, down in my estimation, Sid. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> You've gone down in my estimation. Oh, wow, wow. Having him on the show. I got I got to have all three stigs. It's, you know, I need to be an impartial. All three? Interviewer. Yeah, well, you know, once there's oh, a wait, third one right now. The new one, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Although, you know, if the third stig comes on still in character, I don't think that would be a really uh, interesting interview. Probably just sit here like this the whole time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Our final fan question is from at WTHS Petrolhead. What was your favorite car that you drove while working on Top Gear? Now, uh, probably the Pagani Zonda. The Zonda. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, 
mind you, the only thing about that was that when we got it there, the I'm going to try and demonstrate this. You know the lever that you get in a road car under a steering wheel so that you can put the steering wheel up or down or sometimes nearer you or further away before you lock it into the position. You know, it's like moving your seat, isn't it? Yeah. yeah? Well, their um, locking device for the steering wheel had broken. So I'm driving this Pagani Zonda flat out, and believe me, it's very powerful. You could rear steer this on the power, you know, through, through the corners, all that. But while I'm doing all this, I'm also going like that <laughs> with the steering wheel because it wouldn't stay still. And you're thinking, oh, this is going to smash. <laughs> like, I'm not going to keep being able to hold this like that, you know. But um, but apart from that, that car was, yeah, pretty cool. Okay, so it must have been pretty good if you were still you still liked it despite all of that. <laughs> yeah, I could I could see through it. I mean, I think I had one or two laps when before it busted, but then after that, you're thinking, oh my god, you know. <laughs> all right, well, thank you everyone for those fan question. It's now time to continue to my final batch of questions. Um, we've discussed this a little bit, but I want to discuss it a little bit more in depth because you've said that there's a lot of misinformation surrounding this particular topic. But why exactly did you end up leaving your role as the stig? Um, there was a couple of things, actually. I, I wasn't delighted about the fact that um, we had a vintage car on there, which was a, um, what was it? It was the Aston. Um, it was, a, it was a, a classic car that had been raced at Le Mans uh, by Duncan Hamilton. And that was owned, that's now owned by his son, who's a car dealer. And then after the show, uh, he'd gone to the press saying that I'd wrecked the drive shafts and I'd wrecked the brakes and I'd been a real hooligan. And then there's a, a respected journalist in motor racing who actually carried the story. Now, he should have known better than that and he should have phoned me, you know? And I phoned him up after this story came out about all this because I was livid about this. Um, but of course, because they've put in Perry McCarthy, the stick, as wrecked this thing, then the BBC still wouldn't defend me to confirm it because then it confirms I'm the stick. So I wasn't too happy about that either, you know? So uh, that was going bang. As I said before, I had thought I might like to be a presenter, but that certainly wasn't happening because the team they had was, you know, really great, you know, James, Richard and Jeremy, and they were really going to be going nowhere, you know? So there was no opportunity there. And the other thing was, you know, I was riding for Audi at that time and Audi were very generous, um, but I was testing, I was training, I was traveling. And the BBC really did not want to know about um, altering my contract on what I wanted to be paid to do this. So suddenly there was just very little attraction all the way around about me staying there. So I just said, okay, I don't want to know. And as I said to you, they went, okay. And, and I felt they felt that anyway. So that was it. Didn't, didn't you try to make like a few attempts to maybe do some merchandising with Stig or something like that? to find Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, but I, I took that to the BBC. And I said, look, you know, you're losing out here on, a, on income because we should merchandise the Stig. And I said, that could be a way that gives me the proper remuneration that I was used to as a racing driver. So I said, if I have a company called the Stig Limited, you guys have 50% of it, I'll have 50% of it. Oh, sorry, you have 51%, I'll have 49%. I'll get on with all the manufacturing, the marketing, the sourcing, everything. Yeah, we'll do that. No, they didn't want to know. And then it took them. So that was another thing where I just went, there's just no room here to move, you know? Um, so that was it. So there was... Uh, that I think that pretty much sums it up, to be quite frank. And it took them years before they did start uh, monetizing the Stig character, as they should have done from the beginning. When you look at just how popular Top Gear became later in its running, does a part of you wish you had maybe found a way to stay on the show a bit longer? Because as you're saying, maybe you could have got remuneration down the line. No, but I, I wouldn't have got remuneration down the line. They, you know, I mean, I'm... I'm not too bad at negotiating and they didn't want to know. You know? So that was it. The, the best way to negotiate, in my opinion, is to, is to say you don't want to know then, you know, <laughs> because it's, you know, you can't, you can't carry on doing something if you don't think you're valued correctly. 
I mean, you know, it was one thing riding in Formula One for nothing. It's because I so desperately wanted to be there. But I didn't desperately want to continue being Stiggy on, you know, not very much money, doing something I was getting bored with anyway, with no scope for growth. So it all just, you know, there's no way I would have wanted to have stayed in that position for years and years and years because it just wasn't creative enough for me. I know the following Stig, the guy you mentioned, did it for years and years and years, but you know, that's down to him. I was doing other stuff. Yeah. So, so when you were negotiating, you know, maybe trying to do something to extend it, right? Were you only talking to the BBC or were you talking to Andy Wilman, Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, James May as well? No, there's no need to talk to Richard and James about it, but Andy was really the person that I would be speaking to. And then of course it went into the hands of being reviewed by the BBC lawyers. Um, then it was coming back through BBC. Uh, yeah, it's a long time ago now. It's like 20 years, but it was coming back through BBC worldwide that they just didn't want to do it. Um, and that's to their prerogative. You know, it really was their prerogative. It's, it was their, it was, it was their, um, property. Uh, but I was trying to find a way how we could all win from it, but they didn't want to know. So, you know, that's, you know, I'll always give these things a go because I think that I personally feel it was a bright idea. But they didn't and then didn't move on it as i said for years you know yeah well looking back on your career what are you most proud of your time on top gear making it into formula one or something else uh the book i think really um summing up the story of um you know my own kind of attitude um some did some fairly cool things did a lot of dumb things um but it also you know manages to bring to light you know, my pals, um, what they mean to me inside Matt Racing and, and, you know, touch on their own careers as well. So there's a whole bunch of things that I look back on and think, hey, Crikey, that was a good race. That was a good lap. You know, there's other things I look back on and think that was a crap race and that was a really dumb lap. Uh, you know, it's just, but it's just been, yeah, as an overall attack, it's suited by personality, motor racing. Um, it demands a, a huge amount of concentration. And I guess at heart, I am a fighter and I love driving, you know? So that was, uh, so it kind of, it worked for me, but it could have worked better, but there was always this, you know, money element of no sponsorship and trying to hold on in this team and trying to get ahead, holding on with that team. But, but it is what it is. And, you know, I, there's one thing I probably do know is I, I couldn't have tried harder. I might have been a bit smarter sometimes, but I wasn't. So that's what there is to it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a that's a romantic notion that, like, looking back on it now, your favorite yeah, yeah. thing about it all was just yeah. the story, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right, Perry. That's all I have today. Thank you so that's much wonderful. for coming on to the show. I really appreciate it. That's my absolute pleasure, and thank you very much, Sid. And hello to all your viewers, and uh, wishing you well wherever you are. <laughs>